So last week, Pastor Heather started us off on a new series called True Hospitality, and she spoke to us about loving the stranger is loving our Savior. What a great message. And today we will continue this series. And I'll tell you my topic in a second, but first, of course, a story. So over Memorial Day weekend, we spent time as a family in the place that my father's father bought property about 50 years ago. And this place is precious to our family. As we were gathered there over the holiday weekend, somebody in our family, I can't remember who, started us off on a round of the game. If you, if you knew me, you would know. If you really knew me, you would know. Have we played this, a few of us? Okay. So the point of the game is to kind of start at like a level one answer, you know. So I might say if we were playing, if you really knew me, you would know that I was born and raised in Illinois, okay? And because of that fact, on the north side of Chicago, you know, next round I would probably tell you, and I am a Cubs fan, okay? And then if you still wanted to play the game with me, we would continue, okay? So... As a group plays this, the hope is that you'll get a little bit deeper and a little more vulnerable and the group will bond. So if I was gonna continue, I might say to you, if you really knew me, you would know that for 20 years, my summer was consumed with playing church softball, okay? And then I would probably launch into a story. So that's what you do when you talk about something that you love. So I would like to tell you a story, but I thought to make it a little more complete, you know, I should put on my, my softball jersey, so. All right, you ready? Am I good? Okay. So, our team arrived at the field for the end of the year tournament. We were so excited, you could just feel it in the air. And our team went over to the big board to tell us who we would be playing and what bracket we would be in. And as we get there, we are kind of met with confusion because the people who are in charge of the league have decided that uh, we need to play one more regular season game to determine the seating for the tournaments. And we're kind of like, what? Well, our disappointment deepens when we realize that the team that they have decided that we have to play is the dreaded red team, okay? The fear-inducing, daunting, undefeated red team. We're like, okay. So we take the field, and I'm just going to let you know that it was not pretty. I'm pretty sure we lost 12 to 0. I don't think we ever got a runner past third base. For those of you who are not sports savvy, that's bad, okay? <laughs> and so we ended the game, I mean, we got run ruled, right? We didn't even play the entirety of the game because they, we were losing so badly. So at the end of that game, we tried to brush it off. We went back to the board. We're like, okay, what's the deal? We were second place in the overall seating. So the red team was in one bracket and we were in the other. We're like, thank you, Jesus. So what we knew that, all right, we got to get our heads in the game, push that, victory, that defeat aside. And so we started playing the next game. Well, we won the next game. And it's like single elimination tournament, you know, like losing you're out. So we won that game, and then we won the next game, and then we won the next game. Well, of course, we're paying attention, and guess what? The red team. They won all three of their games as well. So there we found ourselves on the same field against the same team who just hours before had completely crushed us. And we're like, okay. We've got three victories under our belt. It's going to be different this time. You know, we're warmed up. Let's go. And we took the field. Well, in the first inning, we scored, you know? So at least we didn't get blanked again, right? Well, then they scored. Well, then we scored, and then they scored, and then we scored. And, they, and just the lead just kind of kept going back and forth. And as, I, as we're playing this game, I'm, I'm noticing something. So... Um, I mean, this team is undefeated because they have really good players. And their shortstop kept getting in the way of, like, the first and second base baseline, okay? Like, it didn't matter where the play happened, like baseball people, right? You know, like, if the play happens on that side of the infield, then, then the shortstop covers. But no matter what, like, she was just there in the way 
of the runner. And so she had literally flipped a girl kind of over herself who was just trying to get around her to the bag. Now, the thing you need to understand is that this was a big, strong girl, okay? I mean, nobody hits home runs in church softball except her. So um, I affectionately nicknamed her the tree, okay? The tree. The tree was in the way. So um, to make matters worse, uh, as the game progressed, you know, one of my teammates was, was coaching third base, and she overheard this girl tell her teammates, oh, yeah, I'm standing in the baseline on purpose so that people have to go around me. This is church softball. I mean, we're supposed to be nice to one another, right? So with all that information and knowing that the game is on the line, we kind of come to the last inning. So um, my, my super fast teammate is up first, and she gets to first base. So I'm sitting there in, you know, on the side waiting for my turn to bat um, with this bat, actually. Um, this one right here that says Venom. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, you know, waiting. She gets on. And as she's getting on or as she's up to bat, I'm thinking, okay, if I can hit a line drive to right field, which I'm not very good at, but I'm going to try, and if the right fielder then throws the ball to third base, then I am going to just put my head down and run as fast as I can and try to get into second base because we, we got to score, right? So I, I, I'm telling you, I really don't know how to hit to right field very well. But that day, I got up to bat, okay? Now, when I get up to bat, I always, like, wiggle my bat a little, and I get ready. And I don't know why, but just, like, right here. Okay, pitch it right here so I'm waiting and um, when you play church softball the ball comes in really slow okay so you have to just be like wait 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 and then beautiful pitch swung with all my might and the ball it happens just like I visualized it it was amazing okay the ball goes to right field the right fielder scoops it up the, she throws the ball to third base I see the ball arcing through the air. I put my head down and I run with all my might, toe on, first, on for the bag at first, round the bag, running to second. And what I realize as I glance up and look at my path is that the tree is in it. I got to get to that bag. I have to. I only had one choice, you guys, one choice. And it was slide into her with all my might. Now, there's something that um, I failed to take into account. And that is that when a tree falls, it lands somewhere. <laughs> and so I slid into her legs, and then she landed on top of me. <laughs> and she was a big girl, okay? Um, and I had no breath in my lungs, but make no mistake, my friends, my toe never left the bag. Okay, I was not going to be put out. And I watched from the dirt, laying in the dirt, I watched as my super fast teammate crossed home plate, right? And I'm like, all right. Well, we ended up winning the tournament, you guys. We defeated the undefeated team, and it was awesome. And there's our picture, and Deb was in first service. I think Tina's in this service, so, and Carrie maybe is here. I, I can't remember. If, if you're here, there she is. She's right there. We had so much fun winning the tournaments. And so I need, I mean, you can tell I kind of like telling this story, right? And so for years I would tell this story and I'd be so proud of my bravery to take down the tree, right? But then the Lord, as he does, started to show me a little bit different perspective. And what I started to realize is that it may have been my right, the baseline belongs to the runner, it was my right to be in that space, but maybe it wasn't right in the eyes of the Lord to take out <laughs> that girl. In that moment, I didn't know it then, but I know it now, I allowed my own heart to be offended. And I acted offensively in return. And so today, as we look at this topic of an unoffendable heart, I think there's some things that we can learn. Now, I want to say that 
I do believe there's one thing that should offend us. And I think there's one thing that, uh, that Jesus was, took offense at, and that was sin, right? We should be offended by sin. Especially the sin in our own life we should be offended by. We should do all we can to rid our life of it. And some might say the gospel is offensive to those who do not yet believe. To, be, to hear a call to repentance, a call to the one true God who provides us the one way to heaven. We understand those things. Let's look at a definition of offend, okay? I think we all kind of know what it is, but I was kind of surprised at these three primary definitions. The first one, to create anger, resentment, or annoyance. I don't know if one of those hits you more than the other, but I don't like being annoyed. I'm just letting you know. So to create those things. The second thing is to be displeasing or disagreeable. And the third is to violate or to sin. And when you look at those three things, what they all have in common is that to offend requires an act of the will. To create, to be, to violate. So if we are going to have unoffendable hearts, then we have to figure out how we're going to respond when someone else acts offensively toward us. It cannot be meeting offense with offense. That one's off the table. Let's look at what we possibly could do to have an unoffendable heart. In Scripture, there's a section of Scripture that's called wisdom literature. And so as we turn to one of the wisdom literature books uh, of Proverbs, we can learn a few principles. The first is found in Proverbs 19.11. It says this, Those with good sense or wisdom are slow to anger, meaning patient, and it is their glory, honor, to overlook an offense. So there's wisdom in being patient, in being slow to become angry, in being not easily offendable. And I think that is important in and of itself. But I don't want us to miss what the second half of this verse says because I think it adds another element to it that we don't often think about. It is our privilege, our honor, our privilege to overlook an offense. It's something that we do that resembles the very heart of Jesus. It's one of those marks of a mature believer to demonstrate self-control, slow to become angry, and to extend grace to another person. In other words, we overlook it. We don't call attention to it. We refuse to hold that offense against another person. It's not only the right thing to do, but it's the very thing that brings God glory. We rise above. That's what overlook means. So Proverbs principle number one in your handout. An unoffendable heart overlooks offenses. Now we need to add the second principle to it for it to really be complete. So in Proverbs 17, 9, it says, He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates friends. Let's start with the second half of the verse. Hear this. An offense kept between the parties involved is easily solved. Okay? Channeling Dr. Seuss or somebody, rhymey, okay? We get that, right? If I have an offense between me and another person, when we solve it, it's done, it's wrapped. But if, if one or the other of us have told different people what's going on, it's uncontainable. We don't know where it will go once we share that offense with others. Sometimes we share an offense with others because we think that if I can put them down, it somehow puts me up. In God's economy, that doesn't work. Sometimes we say, oh, if I tell this person, then they'll be against them and for me. Again, 
doesn't work. So when we look at the beginning of this verse, it calls us to cover over an offense. Now this covering over doesn't mean just avoid it and ignore it. It actually means forgive it and let it go. That's what it's getting at. Forgive it. Instead, choose to promote love. Those are our two choices when we're offended. We can promote the offense, and we can give it more and more power, or we can cover it over and let it die, and we can promote love instead. I think I'm pretty accurate in saying that offenses will come and go. They're going to happen. But love endures. When I can take an offense and replace it with love, that lasts. Now, the first verse that we looked at, it didn't really distinguish between offenses done to us personally, to me personally, and just offenses. It just said, overlook them. This verse doesn't look at intention or unintention. It says, whatever the offense, cover it over. When we do that, we are Proverbs principle number two, an offendable heart is quick to forgive and free to love. A heart that carries offense in it starts to become hard. A heart that carries offense is just on that verge of sinning itself. But a heart that is quick to forgive is then free to love. What a beautiful, that's a great exchange, right? I think it's crucial that we look at how Jesus handled offense. Sometimes, um, you know, we might be offended because we deserved it. Jesus didn't deserve it ever. He never sinned, and yet he had offense after offense thrown his way. Consider the last week of Jesus' life. In those last few days, we see Judas betray him, Peter deny him, the crowd yell, crucify him. The disciples abandon him. Pilate and Herod question him. And then the soldiers mock and insult him. You guys, that's a bad week. Offense after offense was thrown at him. We can learn some things about how we should respond to offense by looking at what Jesus did and didn't do. The first thing he did was he chose to walk through and not avoid the situation. So sometimes I think it would be super easy to not be offended. Just avoid people, right? Just stay in my safe little spot where nobody can get to me. But that's not what we're called to do. Jesus walked through the situation. And as I was thinking about this, about Jesus being, you know, at every side um, offended. Sometimes when I'm offended, like you can see it in my face, right? My face changes hard, grumpy. But I imagine that as Jesus walked through that week, the look of love in his eyes never left. And I love that. He didn't let the offenses offend him. You see, as Christ followers, it's our call to engage the world and to be an example to the world. And if we respond as the rest of the world when offense is done to us, we're not doing anything to point people to Jesus. And so we have to be an example of showing God's love and redemption to the world. Which brings us to the next point. Another thing Jesus did was he willingly submitted himself to the offenses of others because he knew the end goal. And the end goal, you guys, was the redemption of the world. The redemption of the world. One offense. He got it. He 
endured the temporary in light of the eternal. And that's what he calls us to do as well. Now, I got to put my counselor hat on for one hot second, okay, and say, I am not promoting you remaining in a situation where there's any kind of abuse, okay? That's not what I'm saying. So please hear, the di- there's a difference there. What Jesus did in those moments is he willingly submitted himself to those offenses. So there were also a few things he didn't do. And we can learn much from this as well. The first thing he didn't do is he didn't defend himself. Oh, we're good at that, aren't we? Rationalization, justification, explanation. We're good at it. So even though Jesus had never committed an offense toward anyone else, and even though he was being unjustly accused, he didn't defend himself. So the Gospels of Luke and John give a little bit more of the story of when Jesus was before Pilate and Herod. But I think it is so interesting that in Matthew and Mark, those writers, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chose to only record Jesus saying one thing as Pilate and Herod were questioning him. And it was in response to the question, are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus plainly states, yes, it is as you say. The only thing that Jesus chose to respond to in all the offenses that were thrown his way was to confirm his identity. That was it. What if in response to uh, offenses, instead of playing the one-up game and defending ourselves and all the other choices that we have in front of us, what if we just chose to say, yes, I am a child of God. And I will overlook offenses dealt to me in order to promote love and point people to Jesus. How many arguments could we avoid? Can I say that promoting love, pointing people to Jesus, that's our purpose in this world. Our hope is to make Jesus attractive by responding in love to others. Perhaps I could just mention that no one is attracted to an easily offended person. We're just not. And I wonder if sometimes some of the things that we put in the category, the box of offensive, weren't meant that way at all. The second thing he didn't do is he didn't use the powers available to him. He didn't exercise his rights in that moment. You see, he's the king of the universe, right? He just just let us know he's the king of the Jews. He is the son of God. And he could have called his angel army at any point in time to come and to right the situation, to deal with those who were unjustly accusing him. Any point in time. Instant. But he didn't. He realized that his momentary suffering was willingly endured in order to fulfill his kingdom purpose. Remember what it was? The redemption of the world. And so he chose to do the ultimate covering over, the ultimate promoting of love, when he chose to die on the cross for all the offenses all of humanity has committed for all of time. And it gets me too emotional to go down this road too far. But when I think about Jesus feeling the weight of all that sin as he hung on the cross, I know that he loves me. And so Jesus understood that it's going to take all of our efforts to fulfill that one thing, the redemption of the world. So if I am occupied fully occupied with 
recognizing, engaging with all the tasks that God has prepared in advance for me to do, as it says in Ephesians 2.10, then I really don't have any space or time to deal with petty offenses. I don't. Let's be about kingdom work. Let's be more concerned with promoting God's gospel of love than defending our own territory. In that way, we begin to bring about redemption. In that way, we love the stranger. In that way, we bring glory and honor to God. So I began today by, by telling you about the game. If you really knew me, you would know. And I wonder if I can share one level deeper. So, if you really know, knew me, you would know that this process of attaining an unoffendable heart the, and the ongoing continual process of it, it's been a tough one for me. In my younger years, I was definitely prone to take a defensive stance. I would defend my own rights, my own territory. Um, and I would offend somebody else if I felt like it was in my best interest or theirs. I mean, I literally took a girl out at second base. And what I realized is that I was doing damage and that I was ruining relationships and I was offending the very heart of the God who I wanted to serve and please. And I had to learn to lay down my rights and do what is right and to ask the Lord to take any hard and offended place in my heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. And I want to return to the verses that Tony read for us earlier. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. God says he will. I underlined it so we wouldn't miss it. He will. If you ask him to replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh, he will. If you ask him to put his spirit in you, he will. If you ask him to be your God, he will. He invites us into his family. As we get ready to move into our time of offering, there's a couple questions that, that I wonder if you would take a few minutes to ponder. And if you'd like to respond on your Connect card, uh, please do. So here they are. Is there an offense you have been holding against someone? And is it time to cover it over? Don't hold on to those offenses. They will create in you a heart of stone. Grant forgiveness and let it go. Have you shared an offense with others who weren't involved and you need to make it right? In other words, do you need to seek forgiveness from someone? And third, do you find yourself easily offended and need to ask the Lord to replace your offendable heart, your hard heart, with a heart of flesh that is eager to promote love and point others to Jesus? Take the next few minutes to talk to the Lord. If you want to come to the altar, feel free. Maybe if there's somebody in the room that you need to have a little chat with, feel free. Thank you. 
I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit is at work right now in this room. Can you feel it? I want us to be a church who's not easily offended. And out of that space is free to welcome whoever is in our midst. As the ushers come, we're going to offer a, a moment of prayer. Um, and then we'll take up this morning's offering. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now, Father, as ones who know that there are times that we have offended and there are times that we have received offense. Lord Jesus, would you remove any angst or negative feelings we have toward others? Lord, will we make things right? Would we be people who promote love, who point others to you, who make you attractive, who believe the best about people, and who refuse to have anything sit in our lives that isn't, there, that isn't bringing you honor and glory? Lord Jesus, we love you. And as we give our tithes and offerings to you, Lord Jesus, may we, may we, sur we surrender our lives to you willingly submit our hearts to the good, good Father who wants to give us a heart of flesh, who wants to be our God. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.